anybody need a copy? We're in, the, it says Ephesians chapter 4 continued at the top. Anybody need those notes? Here you go, Mike, if you'll hand those out for me. Ephesians chapter 4 continued. We welcome all of our, our Facebook watchers tonight. And uh, just join in with us. Now, the scriptures won't be displayed uh, as normal tonight, so you're going to need your Bibles to follow along with us uh, tonight. And uh, for any other scriptures that we will be looking up, you will need your Bible. Okay? We're in Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. Everybody got a copy of the notes. Dan and Kelly, good to have you guys tonight. Amen. Amen. Dan was here Sunday, and uh, so thank the Lord for that. Love you, Dan. <laughs> All right. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to teach. I pray now that you will guide our discussion tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit now will just, uh, just fill this room, and your word, Lord, will go forth under the anointing and the authority that you've given your word and for us to teach your word. I thank you, Lord, because you are preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies, and it's by your abundant grace and mercy that we are able to stand here tonight and to proclaim the good news of your gospel. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we've, we've already discussed uh, through verse 6, but I may do a little bit of a, of a quick... Uh, review just because it's been two weeks because last course last week was Thanksgiving and we didn't have service but let's start with verse 1 chapter 4 I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering bearing with one another in love now in verse 1 when he says This has a brand new battery in it. Mike, was this a new battery? Huh? That's all right. We'll use this handheld system. Test one, two. There we go. Okay. Uh, walking worthy of your calling. This And what it's talking about here, walking worthy of your calling, this is... Uh, showing us that this chapter is going to be talking about the calling of God on our life, okay? Everybody in here, God has a call on your life. Everybody that is not in here but is out in the world, God has a call on their life. And it's up to us to answer that call. And it's also up to us to walk worthy of that call. Okay, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now we talked about, we gave definitions of every one of those uh, in our notes in the previous weeks. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, and I want to talk about that for just a second. This, the endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. We talked about the unity of the Spirit and the unity of faith being two different things. Unity of the Spirit is where, you know, it's a spiritual aspect. You can, you can disagree on certain doctrinal aspects. You can do that, but you will not and, and still have unity. But sometimes uh, when, it, when it's, we're talking about a unity of the faith, that's more of people coming together in like precious faith, and you may not have as much unity in, in that type of uh, setting. Let me give you an example. Okay, our church... There's a unity of the faith in here because we all pretty much believe similar. There may be some, some variations of some things that we believe, but all of us believe that, this is, that we, this is a faith walk. We believe in the power of God's Word. We believe in the, in the power of words and confession because we've been taught those things. We believe that God, it's God's will to heal anybody who's sick. All of us, we believe that. And that's what we teach. But now, that's called unity of faith. Okay, but the unity of the Spirit is when a church that, 
believes like we do can work with a church that doesn't believe well like we do but does believe in Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God and as the only way to heaven we can agree on salvation we can work with them through a unity of the Spirit because they're saved by the same Spirit the same God one Lord one God one Spirit just like we are okay so that's he's saying here that we would dwell together in a spirit uh, uh, in a unity of the Spirit and so we can get along with the Baptists, we can get along with the Methodists, we can get along, we can even get along with the Catholic. We can get along with anybody who teaches and preaches Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God and believes that He is the only way to heaven. We can get along and we can work with somebody like that. Amen? All right. So that's, that's what that's talking about here. Then he goes on and, and kind of qualifies what I just said. There's one body. One spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. <clears throat> and this is not, to, baptism there is not talking about water baptism. Baptism, there's one baptism is being baptized into the body of Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are then baptized into the body of Christ. You become a son or daughter of Jesus Christ. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And all this, okay, he, we had gotten through to there. We'd gotten through verse 6, okay, one Lord. And you have notes that can go give you a little bit more information than I did in the review, okay. Uh, so that will get us into uh, verse 7. And so the first six verses of Ephesians was talking about the body, okay, us and how God works through us as a body of believers. And you'll find it when you get over into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. We find there that that addresses how the gifts of the Spirit operate in the church, okay, the body of Christ. These next few verses, beginning with verse 7, is going to talk about how God's giftings work through the individual. See, God doesn't just work with the church as a whole. He works with you as an individual. You are somebody to God. Restoration Christian Fellowship is a, is a body of believers, and we are someones to God, but I myself, or I'm important to God. Linda, you're important to God. Sylvia, you're important to God. Jeremy, you're important to God. If I didn't call your name, you're still important to God, okay? Because God is interested in individuals as well as, as He is churches. And that's important, that you understand that you are important to God. So these next few verses here in Ephesians chapter 4 is God is going to address the believers as an individual and not He's not addressing necessarily the church, but He's addressing the believer, okay? So you're, say, I'm a believer, do you believe that? <laughs> I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I won't sing the rest of that. that was that a Beatles song or? Monkeys. Monkeys. <laughs> That's, you're right. Uh, it's the last train to Clarksville was too, right? <laughs> the monkeys. All right. Okay. So verse 7 here says, and, but to each one of us. So this is, now he's getting down to specifics of the individual. So you could say, but to me was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. But to me was given grace. To you, to you, to you. So you can put your name there in verse 7. But to Sylvia was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. To Mike McKay was given grace. To Thomas. You can put your name there, the individual, okay? So to, to, to each individual, believer is given what? What? To each individual believer is given, what does that verse tell us? Grace. Now, we know everybody's been given the measure of faith, right? But here he's talking about grace. To each individual believer is given grace. This, re this refers to the ministry office in which you stand. Uh, to explain this, I'll read all of the offices in which we stand as servants of Christ are manifestations of the different ministries of Christ. Okay, In other words, a lot of times these, these ministry gifts or offices are called graces. 
Okay, God has given you the grace to be an intercessor. God has given you the grace to speak in prophetic words. God has graced you with the ability to give a message in tongues. Okay, and again, we're talking about individuals. And a lot of times we find that the, the, the ministry gifts are referred to as ministry graces. And this is where this comes from, these graces to stand in this office now, these offices that, we, that we'll find later in Ephesians chapter 5, apostles, prophet, evangelist, teacher, and pastor, okay? These are called the five-fold ministry gifts, right? Yeah. Yes, Dan. Yes. Yes, I listed them exactly in the same order as they are there. Apostle, apostle prophet, evangelist, uh, pastor, teacher. That's... Yeah, well, it is for a reason. And uh, we'll, we'll, when we get to that in, later in chapter 5, we'll get more into the reason for that. But that's for later down the road. But I refer to that because sometimes these offices are called graces because they're not of our own choosing, okay? They're not of our own choosing or our own works. Being a pastor was not my own choosing, I had chosen another path, but then God called me, and he still left the decision to me. He called me to be a pastor, but it was, it was, my, uh, it was still my choice whether to follow him in that or take the own road that I'd already chosen. There's a lot of people that God has called you, but you've determined to go ahead and do what you wanted to do rather than what God called you to do, okay? So these offices, these gifts, you're called to do these things. This is a calling, and you've got to understand that what God has graced you with, the abilities that God has given you, is a calling of God on your life. And that, that is everybody who calls themselves a believer has a calling. God has gifted you with something. Now, tonight we're going to separate these giftings, these callings, or these graces. And for, for our own purposes to help us get a better understanding, we're going to call those, those five uh, ministry gifts that we'll look at in, in Ephesians, we're going to call those pulpit graces. Pulpit graces. I, I was teasing a little while ago it really wasn't it was very true that Teresa was that not true when we started in the ministerial training class and when we were having to prepare to preach to one another Teresa said I'm not getting behind that pulpit God didn't call me to be a preacher and she didn't want to stand behind the pulpit because she considered that the sacred desk of God and I knew where that was coming from but she did, and now she's standing behind, <laughs> behind it uh, a couple of times a week in the prison ministry as God was preparing. But, but she see, that was a calling that he placed upon you, and you finally accepted that and then prepared for it. Now, so there are pulpit graces. There are pulpit gifts. Some of you may never stand behind a pulpit in a church and preach. You may never do that, especially on a regular basis. You may come up and, you know, give a, a, do a testimony, or you may read something. But as far as, as standing as the, the spiritual leader of a ministry, you may never stand behind the pulpit as that, and, and that such. But does that make your gift any less important than the one who's standing behind, behind here on a regular basis. No, it does not. And that's what this is about. So we have pulpit gifts, and then we also have what we would call uh, just regular ministry gifts. Okay? So let's read verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So these gifts, your calling is a gift of God. Whatever you're doing for Christ is a gift of God. 
You will never be happy in your Christian life until you discover and accept this calling. You will never be happy in your Christian walk until you are walking in the gift that God has called you to. And there are people that fight it constantly. They don't want to submit because they want to do things that they want to do. That is called being disobedient. If God calls you to do something and you say, I don't want to do that, what is that called? It's called disobedience. That's what it's called. Now, when your child, and you, most of us in here have our, our children are grown. I don't see any young couples in here right now. But uh, when, when we were, uh, our kids, oh, Teresa, don't even go there. <laughs> you ain't got no youngin' at home. But, well, you, but I mean, but, but, but he, he's old enough to, to know better. So, but anyway, you, you, you said, uh, Chris, did you ever call one of your kids and say, get in here and take this garbage out? That didn't work, huh? And they said, Linda, can you imagine Billy saying when he was little, and you said, Billy, I need you to take this garbage out, and he had to come back and said, but that's not my gift. <laughs> and you'd have said, it is now, because <laughs> I'm giving you that gift. So God calls you to do something, and you look at God and say, that's not my gift. And God says, I wouldn't have called you to do it if it wasn't your gift. You just haven't accepted it. You just hadn't accepted it. So everything that God calls you to do, He gifts you or graces you, gives you the grace to do it. I've had several people tell me over the past seven or eight months, especially with this COVID garbage running around, Saying, boy, I wouldn't have your job for nothing in the world. <laughs> and sometimes I say I wouldn't either. <laughs> but anyway, here we are. Your calling is a gift of God. But the point is you will never be happy as a Christian until you're walking in the gift that God has given you. If God has called you to, be a, to, to give prophecies in church, walk in that gift. If God has called you to be that compassionate soul winner, and now he's called all of us to win souls, okay? But there are some people that he's graced with a special ability to do that, okay? You cannot fulfill, now this is important, you cannot fulfill what someone else is called to do. And someone else can't fulfill what you've been called to do. If you've been called to work in prayer ministry, then you need to get off your duff and work in prayer ministry. If you've been called to work in worship ministry, then you need to be working in work, worship ministry. This thing of picking it up and setting it down, picking it up and setting it down, picking it up and setting it down, I don't believe that's, I don't think that's how God intended that to work. What gifting or grace has God given you? So no one else can do what God has called you to do. So if you get the idea, well, I'm just not going to do it because somebody else will come along and do it for me. But it will never have accomplished what it was supposed to have accomplished if you had done it. And then, now, I can understand this a little bit more now that I'm 64 years old, but I still don't agree with it. When I was younger and I would, I would be trying to get people to do something, the, the older folks in the church, guess what they always said? We've paid our dues. It's time for these young people to take up the slack. Yeah, it is time. But you know what? They still have to have an example set before them. They still have to have some leadership from, from us older folks. This is a different time and era than when you and I were growing up. Folks, it's not like that anymore. It is absolutely not like that. 
And so if God has called you into a ministry, if God has gifted you or graced you, when does that gifting and gracing stop? Not till you breathe your last breath, does it? Because he says, my gifts and callings are what? Without repentance. That means they don't stop. So you can't just take that gift and say, you know what, I believe I'm going to set it down for a while. I believe I'm going to walk away from it. I don't want to do that anymore. I, I, you know, this, this, it's too hard now. It's too hard. This, you don't understand, in 2020, it's too hard. It's too hard to take that gift. It's too hard to walk in that calling. It's too hard to do that. Jesus would probably beg to differ when he was trying to carry his cross and couldn't even carry it. But he never said, he, he, he did say in the garden, this is hard, but if it's still your will, I'll do it. I'll still do it. You should never be jealous of someone else's calling and spiritual gifts. Boy, that's one thing that will break unity in a church in a New York minute. is when somebody else says, boy, I could do that better than they can. There's always been folks that always wanted to tell the pastor how to do his job. And they've never pastored a day in their life. That'd be like me trying to tell an electrician how to wire a house. And I, I'd have us all killed. So I'd, I stay away from things that I'm not experienced about and that God hasn't called me to. But we're always trying to interject. And normally that comes from pride and jealousy. Pride and jealousy. You can never or you should never be jealous of somebody else's gift. Never. You are unique and your calling cannot be fulfilled by somebody else. We've already mentioned that. The body of Christ is a team and we all need to play our position or part. Now, when I was younger, no, I wasn't very athletic because I was, uh, uh, well, I was skinny as a rail. I could, I could take a shower in a shotgun barrel. I could stand behind a telephone pole and you couldn't find me. It was easy for me to play hide and seek because <laughs> I could stand behind anything. They couldn't see me. I, I was so tiny and skinny. Anyway, I wasn't very athletic, and, uh, but I did play Little League baseball. And now, where, where do they put the person where the least amount of balls are going to be hit? Right field. Guess where I played? Right field. <laughs> How many of y'all were right fielders? <laughs> That's funny when I ask that question. Everybody said right field. <laughs> Where'd you play, Chris? Third. But Woo, you were on the hot corner. Did you snag that ball? Fired across that diamond the first and get him out. All right. For a little while, anyway. Well, I pay, played right field because I think in all those... Amanda, don't you laugh at me. You would never... In all those days of playing Little League Baseball, I might have had two balls hit to me and I missed both of them. <laughs> you was a bench warmer. I was out, 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 out. Out, way out in the outfield. Yeah, it was rolling by the time it got to you. Well, that's like... Ashley... Uh, She's not in here, and she, she, but I'll go ahead and say this. When she signed up for softball, and, you know, she was about six years old, maybe five. She was out in the outfield, and she was picking clover, sitting on the ground while that's playing. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but it was, uh, but yet, I, pl I had to play my position right field. I, I, I couldn't be jealous. Now, I would have loved to have been the pitcher, but y'all, I couldn't pitch. I would have loved to have been the third baseman, but I wouldn't have had any teeth left. <laughs> it would have been great to have been the first baseman, but they would have all been safe because I couldn't catch the ball. You follow what I'm saying? So I had to play the position that I could attempt to at least play. <laughs> I wasn't very good at it, but, but somebody had to be the right fielder, and that was me. Me and another guy, we, we took turns. <laughs> So in church, it's the same way. It's a team, and, and you, you might be, feel like you're the right fielder. That's right. We've got to have a right fielder. We've got to have a pitcher. We've got to have a catcher. We've got to have a shortstop. Everybody always wanted to be the shortstop. 
I always wanted to be the shortstop. We got to have all these positions in the church. We got to have people in place. And so you can't get jealous of another. You know what will do? What will happen though? You know what will happen? Is if you are truly called and, and you desire to be used in a gift more than what you're used in right now, if you will be faithful to that little thing that God has called you. He said, He who is faithful over little things, I will make him ruler over much. Or God says that He will give you a, a promotion. He will give you a promotion. I never will forget a uh, uh, gentleman who, who was over the helps ministry uh, in, in a particular denomination, and he, he made this statement that when he started out in ministry, he was the janitor. He was a volunteer janitor. In other words, he cleaned the bathrooms in the church. And he kept thinking, you know, the pastor was, uh, would be there. And, and he thought, man, one of these days, one of these days I want to be a pastor. I know that God can do that. I know that. And so the Lord told him, said, you be the best janitor you can be. And one of these days you'll be more than a janitor. And so every time he got in there to clean bathrooms or anything in the church, he did it to the very best of his ability. He made sure it was sparkling clean. And people noticed it, how clean everything was. You know what that man is today? He's the head of, an, of, a, of a ministry, and he goes all over this nation teaching the ministry of helps. And he wrote a book called Instructions from Timothy. And he started out cleaning bathrooms. But he did it to the very best of his ability. If you will do what God has called you to do, this gift, this individualism that God has given you, if you will give it 110%, God will promote you. God will promote you. And he will give you the desires of your heart. And, if, and, and he, he may put you in a place of higher position. But if you try to get to that place of higher position by running over people, running down people, and trying to move people out of your way. You may get that position. But you'll never be happy in it. Because it will, it, you will come crashing down. Because you will have built your house on sand. That's what happens in the political arena. People run over anybody and everybody. They, in order to get to a higher place. That can never and should never ever happen in the church. Never should that happen in the church. You let God promote you. And you say, you might be saying, but the, the pastor never pays attention to what I do. The pastor doesn't, he doesn't see the things that I do. You would be surprised what the pastor sees. And you would be surprised at what the pastor hears. Y'all know when you say somebody, now don't tell pastor I said this. Guess who the first person they call is? Now don't tell so and so that I told you this, but. Do you know how many times I hear that? More than I can count on my hand. It'll not, not, I didn't hear none of it today. And, I, and honestly, that's not a big problem in this church. It really isn't. Uh, I, when I say that, I, I sincerely mean that. That's not a big problem. But normally, things do get back. Okay? Your pastor's going to find out about it. So you are unique in your position. Fulfill it and do what God has called you. Now, also verse 7, as I said, introduces the fivefold ministry gifts found in verse 11. Uh, and these are sometimes called the pulpit gifts or offices in which I've already mentioned to you. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor. Notice pastor is listed last. And we'll discuss that why when we get to those later on in Ephesians chapter 5. Now then, there are seven other offices, and this is important. Uh, there are seven other offices for a total of 12 gifts in the New Testament. Okay, for a total of 12. And they're found in Romans chapter 12. And these are sometimes called, at, uh, referred to as body gifts or offices. We have pulpit gifts, okay, or offices. And then we have body. What do we mean by body? I'm sorry, what? 
The church body, exactly. The, the, these, these operate within the body of Christ, okay? Uh, 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 1 Corinthians 12 refers to, you know, the body being, you know, one's the head, one's the foot, one's the eye, tongue, the eye, so on and so forth. Those are body references, and so there are body gifts. So we have the pulpit gifts. Everybody understand what the pulpit gifts are? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, and pastor, okay? Again, I'll give you a more. We'll, we'll look at each one of those offices when we get to that. Then these seven other gifts are referred to as body offices, and these are verses 6 through 8 in Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let me read those. I'm not used to not having the up there. Okay, 6 through 8. Uh, Verse 7, but to each of us grace was given in the verse 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to men. And these are the gifts, okay? The five pulpit gifts and the seven body gifts. These are the gifts that he gave, okay? So as we look at these, uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of move over into Romans and we're going to look at these body gifts, from Romans chapter 12. So if you got your Bible, you may want to turn there. Verses 6 through 8 says this. Having then gifts. Remember, having descended to give gifts unto men. So when were these gifts handed out? Right off the bat. When, did, when were these gifts given? He just answered it in Ephesians chapter uh, 4 verse 8. When he ascended on high and gave gifts to men. So this is after the resurrection, okay? And even after the ascension, just before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these gifts were released, and I would say these gifts were released in conjunction with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So it was more than just the Holy Spirit coming and speaking in tongues and fire upon each one. At that same outpouring, gifts were released into the church. Gifts that were just uh, functioned in the Old Testament on certain occasions, but gifts in that time with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would be for all time and could happen at anywhere, at any time, wherever God may need you or where that gift needed to be in operation. These gifts would become a part of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I believe that these gifts that were given upon his, as he ascended was the same as uh, he gave those out through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So these seven gifts, okay, let's look. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Prophecy, let us prophesy. Now, this prophecy is different from the office of the prophet in the pulpit gifts. Okay, this gift of prophecy, anybody, you can be used in prophecy and not be a prophet, so to speak, or, work, or walk in the office of the prophet, okay, and we'll, we'll discuss that difference, but everybody in here, as a matter of fact, Paul goes on in, in uh, Corinthians and says, I would that you all prophesy. So what is prophecy? What does prophecy do? What's this supposed to do? Is this a prophecy? Mike, you are nothing but a low-down scoundrel. Okay? Did that edify? Did that encourage? Did that lift up? <laughs> that might be a word of knowledge and not a prophecy. A democratic word. <laughs> a democratic word of knowledge. No. A prophecy... The Bible teaches us that prophecy is for the edification of who? The saints. Edification of the saints. You be a saint. You are a saint. Prophecy is for the edification of the saints. Okay, so here in Romans we find that one of the first gifts that was distributed as a body gift and not as one of the five-fold ministry gifts was prophecy. Prophecy. All can prophesy, but not be a prophet, okay? 
Then it goes on and says, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, what does that mean? Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, just stop and think for a minute. Everybody's been given the measure of faith. That means you got the same amount of faith that I did. You got the same amount that Mike did. Cheryl got the same amount that you did. Everybody in here got the measure of faith, and it was the same for everybody, saint and sinner alike. Even the sinner has gotten that same measure of faith because God gave the measure of faith. Now then, so what's it what's talking about here? According to what? What does that say? I'm not up there at my Bible. What does it say? According to what? Your portion? Is that what it says? I guess I'm going to have to get up here and read it for myself. In proportion to your faith. In proportion to your faith. So if I've got the measure of faith and you've got the measure of faith, what would be the proportion of your faith as opposed to my faith? What makes your faith stronger than my faith, Sylvia? Mike, what makes your faith stronger than Thomas's faith? What's the proportion? You want me to tell you what it is? The Bible tells us this. said We've all been given the measure of faith, but the way you get your faith increased or more activated, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you can tell if a person is in the Word of God and if they're really applying it and hearing it by how much faith they walk in. We always thought it was if they didn't cuss. Did you know that people can tell how much faith operates in this church when they walk in the door? A good, strong Christian who is a faithful Christian can discern if a church body is walking in faith. And you as an individual, you can, t- you, can walk, you can talk to somebody and you can tell if they're walking in faith or not. You can discern that in the spirit. People come in my office, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I can discern right off the bat if they're walking in faith or not. It's not hard to tell. First of all, you just do it through observation. You do it through, they don't know anything about God's Word. So you know they're not listening to it. They're not reading it. They're not, they don't even know what it says. If you don't know what the Word of God says and you're not listening to it, you're not going to have a whole lot of faith. You're, you're going to have the measure of faith. But your faith is not being exercised and it's not being activated and it's not growing. Okay? So you prophesy according to the proportion of your faith. The more you study God's Word, the more you learn His Word, the more you hear His Word, guess what God's going to be able to use you more in? Prophecy. You'll be able to speak into other people's lives because you have experienced it for yourself in this book. And then God will use you in prophecy because as you learn His book, you won't prophesy something that can't be found in that book. You'll be making a prophecy of something that is going to line up with God's Word. And you, the more you study that Word, the more you hear that Word, the more your faith is activated and continues to grow. You'll never be classified a false prophet because your prophecies will always line up with God's Word. Don't, I don't want to be a false prophet, do you? If I'm going to prophesy, I want it to be true. I want, to, I want it to know that I heard from God. So this prophecy is according to the proportion of your faith. Then he goes on and he says, that's number one, or ministry. Well, ministry, the gift of ministry. Now, the Greek word here for ministry is diakonos, which means deacon. Okay, in the Greek, diakonos or diakonos means deacon. The deacon is not a five-fold minister. Now, many have wanted to be, but they're not a five-fold minister. The deacon, and you can find this in Acts chapter uh, 5, where they chose out the seven. 
The deacon is a member of the congregation and is not set in the church to run the pastor who is a fivefold minister. So the fivefold ministry is at this level. The body gifts are at this level, and the body gifts are never to overrun the fivefold ministry. But the reason many, many churches have so much issues in their church government is because they're getting the body ministries confused with the five-fold ministries, and we have deacons running churches rather than pastors being the authority in the church. It's hard for me to teach on things like that, being a pastor, because it sounds like, you know, I'm tooting my own horn. I'm not. But here's another deal I want to make very, very clear. I've never had that issue here. Never have that, has that been an issue in this church. Never has that been an issue in this church. I've pastored churches where it was an issue. And you've probably attended churches where it was an issue. But it's not an issue here. We've got that squared away. We know what our place is. And so here we find ministry, referring to diakonos, uh, or deacon, and, and, and the, the board of a church is not a part of the fivefold ministry. They're a part of the congregation, and they're part of the body gifts. So being a deacon, as a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us later on that, you know, there's a deacon's reward in heaven. There's an elder's reward in heaven. There's a pastor's reward in heaven. Okay? There's, there's something that's going to have specifically uh, <clears throat> a reward for that. Then we find, again, teacher uh, as we move on. Let us use it in our ministering. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. And remember now, the, the root word there is diakonos or deacon. Okay? So let us use it in our ministry. And then he who teaches in teaching. So teacher is another one of the gifts of the body. Now, a, a Sunday school teacher is not a part of the five-fold ministry of teaching, the office of a teacher. Follow along with me here, okay? Everybody in here can be a teacher. A teacher just simply means somebody who is apt to teach. You have an ability to teach someone else. You may be someone who can teach someone your same age, someone older than you, someone younger than you, Someone, it may be that you can teach one person at a time, or you may be of, of an ability to teach a whole class at a time. But regardless, that's teaching. It's teaching. And so this body gift that is mentioned here in Romans is the gift to be able to teach. But again, it's not the fivefold gift. And I hope, is everybody following? And I'm not getting these confused, am I? Okay. So he who teaches in teaching, uses, uses gift in teaching. So he goes on, he says, he who exhorts, an exhorter, an exhorter. Now, what's an exhorter? An encourager. Okay. Back in the day, <clears throat> they had a... Uh, the ministerial credentialing committees, especially in the Assemblies of God, I can only speak for them since I was a part of that, but <clears throat> they, they, you started out in the ministry of credentialing as an, you got an exhorter's license. Later on, they changed that to a, uh, a Christian worker license. They changed it to something different. And uh, then, then, then the second step was you became a licensed minister. And then the third step was ordination. You became an ordained minister. But it started out, and I believe the church of God still calls it an exhorter's license, okay? Uh, Brad, do you know anything about that? I know that uh, I heard them talk about it a lot, an exhorter. So an exhorter, and this is where it comes from, one who exhorts in exhortation, uh, says here, one who has given a God-given ability to encourage and exhort sinners to become born again or believers to be more dedicated to the Lord. So this is, this, while I was talking about a special gift, all of us are supposed to witness, right? All of us are supposed to, to but have you ever met somebody that just has a knack for getting people saved? They, they, it's just like it's a special gift. Guess what? They're an exhorter. 
They've got a special gift. They have a special gift of, of, of convincing people to rededicate their life. And, and this is where the exhorter license came from because it's recognized as a gift, a body gift, but not one of the five-fold gifts, okay? And so this, uh, these people, uh, there are people in, in this congregation here tonight that you have a, 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 a special ability to reach somebody for Jesus. Now, uh, and, and some people can reach people that others can't, okay? And so this all comes into this gift. These are all giftings. These are body gifts. All of these should be operating in our church. Every one of these, we should have people prophesying, and we do. We should have people teaching, and we do. There are people over near the building teaching tonight. We should have people exhorting, and we do. See, these are body gifts that operate within the whole body of believers. And, but you don't have to stand behind a pulpit to do these gifts, right? You don't have to be up here and, and because that's not what the calling is of these body gifts. So the exhorter, we find here, and it, this, is, this is important, we are all called to be witnesses, but the exhorter has a gift in this area. Sometimes the exhorter eventually gets called into the five-fold office of an evangelist. Someone that has that special ability to, to win people for Jesus Christ, you know, they become a prime candidate to become an evangelist. I'm not going to call them to be an evangelist, but God may call them to be an evangelist, okay? And this is, again, where the exhorter came from. So if you have that special ability to lead somebody to Jesus Christ, you really need to listen to the call of the voice, the, to, to the voice of the Lord to see if God may be calling you into a higher place than just where you are to get you in a greater position a place of greater influence all right and then we have a lot of people don't understand this but we we're all the, the giver okay let's keep reading he who exhorts in the exhortation he who gives with liberality now is everybody called to give everybody's called to give how many of you know that there are people though who are have a gifting of giving. God has blessed them and it doesn't bother them the least bit to stroke a $10,000 check. Some of us might have a heart attack if God asks us to do that. Some of us might just, you know, if God said, I want you to give every penny you got in the bank. Wait a minute, God. But some people, it's just a gift. They don't care. They don't have a bit of problem because it is a special gifting that God has given. To the giver, to the one who gives, give with liberality. So let's look at this gift. This per person is motivated to give by a call on his heart. Just like anybody who's called to prophesy, anybody who's called to exhort, anybody who's called to preach, anybody who's called to teach, this person is called to give. And you know what normally happens to someone who's been called to give as a special grace? Everything they touch turns to money. Have you ever met somebody who can just make money hand over fist? <laughs> And, and you're sitting there work, working your fingers to the bone just to try to get by with what you got. But if somebody else comes along and everything they touch just turns into profit, 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 profit. You know what normally happened to that person is they're a giver. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not. That doesn't mean that you're not. Okay, don't, so please don't take it that way. You're, you're doing what, what God has called you to do. But God has put a special grace on that person. And he has now got them to a place where he knows if he blesses them with $50,000, it's not a question that they're going to give probably ten dollars or $15,000 of it away. They're not going to calculate, well, let's see, 10% of 50000 is five. So, boy, I'm not going to give $5,000 and a penny because I, I don't want to dare give God any more than what he's asked me to. But this person is a person who has a gift of giving that doesn't care. He's not calculating how much he needs to give. He's calculating how much God has asked him to give. That's the giver that gives liberally. I believe that Jesse Duplantis is one of those kind of guys. 
He don't, he, that, that guy is, is, he's always, even before he was a Christian, he was a giver. He had a, he had a rock band and he gave. He made money hand over fist. Everything that man touches turns to money because he's always been a giver. He has a, he has a grace of giving. A grace of giving. And so God says, you know what? I can bless Jesse with $100,000 because he's going to give $50,000 of it over here to this, this ministry. And he's never going to question God. And, and that's why he can stand up and say, God never told me to ask for money. God told me to build something. He said, so I don't ever ask for money. And, but God always supplies it. That's the gift of being a giver. Y'all looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm not going to give any more than God requires. Well, okay. Not going to get any more either. <laughs> it's just that simple, isn't it? I have found, I have found that the more that I give, the more God blesses. Now, I've preached that, and I, I've talked about it, and I've taught it, and all that kind of stuff, but I have experienced it. I've been able, and I'm not bragging, y'all. Please don't think this is bragging, but I have been able this year to give to more ministries than I've ever given to in my life, not just to our church. And I give my tithe to our church through Easy Tithe, just like many of you do. But I've been able to give to other ministries. I've been I've been able to give to Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I've been able to give to ICFM. I've been able to give to Rama. I've never been able, to, it's been all I could do to just pay my tithe, you know. But God is, as I've, as I've launched out and, and, and been able to give a little bit here, God has blessed me where I can give more there and now a little bit over here. It's, it's an incredible thing that God will do. And, and I pray all the time, God, I want that gift of giving I want to be able to give. I, want to, I don't want to calculate, well, i got to give 10%. I want to give above that. I want to give way more than that. I want to give way more than that. And God's getting me to that place. So this giver. Do what? If you, yeah, you give out of your need. Exactly. Okay, then we find, uh, goes on and he says, uh, uh, he who leads with diligence. Now this lead here, in, is, in some translations is called a ruler. And rulers are, are called the elders of the church. The elders are the ones who help the church in pastoral care. Okay, Now, actually, terminology is, is you know, important in some aspects. But, and we really, our, our board here at the church, in its official capacity in our church constitution of bylaws, you guys and ladies are not deacons. You're elders. Okay. That's, that's your official title in our Constitution bylaws. So uh, Brad and Dan and Mike and Sylvia and Chris and uh, Jack, you guys aren't deacons. You are elders, okay? You're elders of the church, and you are to assist <laughs> in the pastoral care of the church. Uh, so you don't, you don't you're, you're, this church is set up where the, it is not run by the deacons because there are no deacons. It's elders that we all assist together. And it was set up that way on purpose because we believe that it's, it's a scriptural uh, model to follow. And then the last one is even mercy. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You know what? Mercy, when, when a person has the gift, this body gift of mercy, doesn't say, oh, I guess I'll give to Angel Tree this Sunday Man, I tell you, I can't believe that every time I go to church, they're asking for money for the parking lot. Or they're asking money for Angel Tree. Or they're asking for money for some needy family. I guess I'm going to give $2 and I'm going to, you know. But man, I tell you what, I was going to go to McDonald's and get two large teas. You may as well keep that money in your pocket because it's not going to do you a bit of good to give it because you're not giving it cheerfully. He who shows mercy or compassion with cheerfulness. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad it's 8 o'clock. I get to close on this one. 
He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, y'all, I'll be honest. Right, I'm right there. Sometimes I, when I do something for somebody, I'm not too happy about it sometimes. God, I can't believe you had me do that. Sylvia, has that ever happened to you? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a, the, a, a, a last illustration. Monday... If you ever go to downtown Birmingham, you better have some cash with you because there's going to be people asking for it, okay? Well, Monday, <clears throat> Angela had a doctor's appointment. Uh, she had to get COVID tests, which was negative, uh, by the way, uh, Monday morning and because she had a colonoscopy yesterday. So, by the way, it all came back clear, no cancer, it's as clear as can be, no problem, no issue whatsoever, amen. So, uh, we, we was at an intersection, and uh, some church, had, they had people out there with buckets raising money for, to help feed homeless people. So, I got all the cash I had, and Angela got the cash she had, and we gave it to them. Because you know how many times when I was a youth pastor, we stood out at intersections with buckets raising money to take kids to... To places so when I see a church out there with buckets I put money in it okay if I got any I put it in it so I'd already given all my cash well then I took her over and I dropped her off at Spain rehab because she had about an hour appointment in there and I parked and I in it and she could she was having to have the colonoscopy the next day so she couldn't eat so I said well I'm gonna walk over here to Guthrie's at the hospital and I'm going to and it was cold it was snowing it was cold and I don't know why I walked I guess I, I, no matter, I, I wouldn't have been able to find a parking place. Anyway, I walk, o, I walk over there, and, and I forgot my mask. Well, I was parked in the, where, where we, got it, we got it stamped at Spain Rehab. So anyway, I forgot my mask. And so I walked in Guthrie's, and there was a young man standing there, and he was shivering. He was, he was shivering. His teeth was, sh you know, he was just shaking. He was so cold. And he said, sir. Would you happen to have a couple of dollars so I could get something to eat? And I said, come in here with me. I wasn't going to stand out there and talk to him. I said, come in here with me. And so the guy goes, you can't come in here without a mask. I said, well, we were going to eat in here. And all them people over there, they're eating. They don't have a mask on. You can't eat with a mask on. Can't, can't help it. You can't order. You can't even order without a mask on. If you got a problem with that, talk to the governor. Now, that was just his attitude. I said, okay, we'll see you. We'll go somewhere else. And so uh, the guy said, come on, follow me. And when we went next door to Waffle House, walked right in and sat down. <laughs> you know, they didn't say a word. And uh, so I told him, I said, get, get whatever you want. Get whatever you want. And, man, he ordered sausage and eggs and gravy and biscuits. And, and he ate like he hadn't eaten in two or three days. Well, the, the, what I was going to say, and you know what? Now, I really felt the reason I walked was so I would run into him. And my whole point is not to pat myself on the back, but I enjoyed helping him. I enjoyed helping him. That prophecy that you read, Teresa, I enjoyed. I didn't begrudge it one bit. I didn't say, God, I can't believe I'm having to put up with this guy. But we sat there and we talked. We talked about his family. Uh, his mother committed suicide. You know, and, and his dad, he was from Chattanooga. And, and I talked to him. I said, well, why, why are you homeless? Well, I just got into drugs and all this stuff. Now, he wasn't high. He wasn't high. And uh, I prayed with him. Right there in Waffle House, prayed with him. And asked him if he had ever received Jesus as his Savior. He said, I did when I was a little boy. But we prayed. And, you know, I prayed a, a rededication prayer with him. And prayed protection over him. And prayed for a job. And all of these kind of things. And, uh, and I was glad to be able to do it. And that's the difference in being a cheerful person of compassion and saying God I can't believe you put me out here amongst all these homeless people and now every one of them is asking me for money you see the difference that's one of the graces that's supposed to operate in the body of Christ don't begrudge when God puts somebody in your path that needs a little help Amen. All right, we're through. As a matter of fact, I went five minutes over. Let's stand. Did y'all get anything out of this tonight? All right. All right. These are the body gifts, and that includes you. Amen. Dan, it's so good having you tonight. I'm going to let you dismiss us in prayer, sir. You knew that was coming, didn't you?